underrepresented communities. So what we want to do is open um, it up for uh, questions and just uh, and also just get a time check on on where we are. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I'm Bill Adair. I run the journalism program at Duke. I'm the night chair there. Uh, Charlie, I, the point you just made about the decline in editing is something that we've seen with a lot of our students who are doing internships, and it's something that I'm very concerned about and have tried a variety of solutions to help with. Um, the biggest is I've done editing, um, and mm -hmm. I have stepped in and helped my students who are working at local news organizations who will send me their story because they're just not getting edited. Right. And so they'll send me their stories ahead of time and say, what do you think of this? And, you know, who do you, th and, and I wonder if um, there's a more organized way to kind of institutionalize that that could take advantage of us, both in, in yep. academia, but also a variety of, of journalists who are available to help with things like that, because that's so important. We've had some students who will come back to me after an internship and say, it was awful. Yeah. I didn't get any editing. Right. They didn't take advantage of me, you know, whatever. And so that's so important yeah. because these students are fired up about journalism and they get into these places and they're like, eh, I sat around. Yeah. It's a real problem, and thanks for highlighting it. This is, this is an area for innovation and partnership. This is a place where we want to work with people who might help us figure out that piece of the puzzle. How can we take people like Phil Bennett, my old boss, who teaches uh, at Duke and who, you know, who is uh, working with Frontline often and also on their local news initiative. And so one of the great editors of the Boston Globe and the Washington Post who is now at Duke there's a network of super talented editors out there who are underemployed or who are moving on. I, we're really desperate to try to corral them and get their support, bring their energy into our operation. Um, there's Investigative Editors Network, which is, we're doing an experimental partnership with them. Um, we've done some editing ourselves. You know, we do this with great, um, trepidation. We never, we, we assign the Report for America Corps member to the newsroom and they then work for that newsroom. They are an employee of the newsroom with benefits. Their employee. So every time we approach, and I'm, I'm really feeling like, I know I was, I was a city editor at the New York Daily News. I would have bristled if anyone from outside tried to tell one of, you know, our reporters what to do, right? So I go at it with great respect, but what I'm hearing is editors are, uh, you know, the sort of senior editors are saying, absolutely, if you have some time to work with Michelle Liu on the prison project and you can show her maybe a FOIA strategy, how to get at that, or how can you get, like, death certificates for the inmates, they have to be filed. We're finding that there's great um, openness to doing that, but I still think it's a real sensitive thing. You have to be super careful with it, right? So any good ideas we'd be welcome to or any partnerships we should know about. Including funding into. partnerships. Yeah, that yeah. too, yes. I was curious, are you guys talking about primarily uh, print journalism or television journalism? The uh, collaboratives um, have representatives from every platform, from digital startups uh, to his tiny Hispanic radio stations to uh, traditional black radio stations to public radio stations to the legacy newsroom. And that is one of the most interesting aspects of these collaboratives where the growth, uh, professional growth happens when they are all sitting together and um, they are used to competing, but they also have built-in ideas about each other. And now they need to revisit them, and they need to think about how to tackle a project as a team. Um, so there are some uncomfortable moments, you know, some right. moments that I call uh, being in a crowded subway car in New York in the summer without air conditioning. <laughs> uh, everybody's kind of looking at each other and not saying anything, and well, mm, uh, mm. Uh, but these things need to be aired and they are part of why um, some communities 
feel that they are not adequately covered because these things have not been talked about among journalists. How are we doing our job? Where are the gaps in coverage? What are we not doing that you are doing? Um, sure, you may be a small, scrappy uh, startup, but um, you have inroads into uh, this ethnic community that I don't. Everybody brings something to the table. Our, and ours are very similar. We, we, again, we're right in alignment with Solutions Network on that. We have a combination of large newspapers um, like the Dallas Morning News or we have El Nuevo Herald here. Um, and we have small newspapers uh, like the Charleston Gazette Mail I mentioned or we have the Bay State Banner in Boston, African American newspaper with a long tradition in Boston, also really struggling like almost every newspaper. We have digital startups like Mississippi Today is a digital startup. We have a lot of public radio stations. We have 39 public radio stations that we're providing a reporter to. So we, we also believe deeply in the digital future, those that have show a sustainable model. We want to invest in them. Public radio is amazing at bringing community support in, so they're a wonderful partner. Traditional newspapers are starting to wake up that like their old business models are going to have to be more innovative. They're going to have to think about a nonprofit arm. And we're seeing this. And I've met great resistance from dear friends of ours at these newspapers who think that, they're, that there's some cultural thing they're resistant to around the nonprofit sector. And I really deeply believe the future is nonprofit newsrooms. We're about half of our newsrooms now are nonprofit, half aren't. I think we're going to start trending toward the majority being nonprofit. Well, I would just add family um, in independent owners. We have yep. been really uh, getting to know the next generation of family and independent yeah. owners. And um, yeah, yes, totally. you know, with that there's, and also local television, there's a huge opportunity with local television, uh, with public uh, television. Um, in many communities, the largest digital footprint is the local television commercial station and the largest audience. And we are now working with an increasing number of local television leaders who understand their opportunity to move away from the old broadcast formats, formats and to produce journalism in the public interest. Right. Because not only does journalism in the public interest serve their communities, it's good for business and ratings, as is really deep quality investigative reporting. WCNC in Charlotte has been one of the most active um, partners in that collaborative. And in our collaborative in New Hampshire, Public uh, PBS has been one of the leaders really in that, uh, uh, in that collaborative, so definitely. We've had uh, a couple of investments in Spectrum News and we're looking for more. The hard part with an emerging journalist, someone in their early years, is how do you fit in? Are you on air? Are you a producer? It's harder to know how they'd serve the community in a, in a, oh, in a television. And I think that we're open. We, we, we'd love it if people said we're going to open a bureau in this rem more remote region of our, of our viewership. Uh, and we're going to put someone young there. But then you have to have the support services to really train them and produce them. And, We've honestly, we've struggled with it. So if you have ideas, we'd be all yours. You know, I, I was a journalist for five years and then I went to PR. So I was one of those people when you talked about that mentor to kind of bring right. their teeter tottering on, I got to get out of here. I can't make it another right. day right. or can I make it another day? But what I think, what I always thought was really essential and what was missing was, was management training for people who were running the newsrooms. Right. So it'd be really curious if you could maybe start putting, I know you can't do mm -hmm. the, the people that are emerging, right? but maybe training some managers on how to have mm -hmm. that different perspective. Because when you've got a journalist coming, you know, when I'm an, as a PR person, they are wanting to do stories all the time, and they come to the event and they know nothing. Right. Uh, they're having to crank out stories for 4.30, the 5, the 5.30, the 6, the 7.30. With 30, no and editorial then, supervision. Right, and, yeah. it, and you know, I, and then the, the midnight, or not midnight, 11 o'clock right. show. That's a lot of writing in a very short period of time. Yeah, here's a And, and they're one-man banding, when, too. When I started in this profession a very long time ago, it was one-to-one -one journalist to PR person. Now it is like five and a half to one PR to reporter. Wow. So we are, we are vastly outnumbered as journalists these days. 
Something I've always wondered is how could you unleash the journalistic talent in public relations, not just to serve their company or their mission, but to come across and try to create some of these editing cores or find funding networks for us or say that, this, that PR societies are going to serve communities by helping support editors and training managers. And look, the need is so great, right? We are in a full-blown, house-on-fire crisis in local news. So ideas that, that you have that might be about how could we do this are so welcome. And the, and the key is it doesn't take millions of dollars to affect change in a local community. For relatively small dollars, $10,000, $20,000, you can be part of putting a reporter in there to make a difference. So anyone who has ideas really want to encourage you to talk with us and share with us what they are. More questions? Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Matt Hagman. Uh, I had the great pleasure of working with Liza. It's great to see you back in Miami. And of course, with Jennifer, I formerly was at the Miami Herald and Knight Foundation with Jennifer. Uh, but I have a question for Charlie. Um, uh, what is the hoped for outcome when someone finishes their mm -hmm. time for Report for America as a result of all these reporters being out there with newspapers and radio stations and the rest? What is hope, hope to be achieved? And I'm also just curious just about the transition from reporter to entrepreneur and yeah. what prompted that. And Sure. Uh, to answer the first question, I think there are sort of two broad directions of outcomes that we're interested in. There's the outcome for the community, which we think is the most important outcome of all, right? So if we put reporters in to serve that community, we're seeing quantifiably that we are having impact in the increase in the number of stories in the areas where we're investing to fill a news desert. For example, in Appalachia, where we put Will Wright, really talented reporter, um, two years ago, our favorite front page from the Report for America program launching in a city was when the Lexington Herald said, Report for America reopens Pikeville Bureau. So Pikeville, Kentucky, is the heart of coal country. Lexington had shut down its bureau in Pikeville 10 years earlier. Will was there to reopen it. Like, that is so exciting. because. As someone from Boston, we confess to this Red Sox Nation thing already, I knew I didn't know about coal country. But what I didn't realize is Lexington, Kentucky, doesn't know about coal country. That's like a whole other, that's that complex web we saw on the, on the, uh, at the presentation today when they were looking at the map of America. Like, so Lexington might show up as one of those blue prosperous cities. And then you have this distressed Americana out in coal country. I would say Will Wright overnight has increased the number of stories coming from that region by 300% for the paper. He's deepened understanding. And just by showing up, he affected change because there was a lack of access to clean drinking water. And he just went to a county commissioner's meeting where that issue came up. He reported on it. Next thing you know, it is, it is a statewide story. And then it is a national story about lack of access to clean drinking water for tens of thousands of people in poor rural areas of Appalachia, as if it was all the way back to the Great Society. Nothing had changed. It was really eye-opening. And it affected immediate change. The person in charge of, of water uh, was, was pushed into early retirement. Wasn't quite as good as getting fired, but he, he got pushed out. And about 4 or $5 million was immediately put toward fixing the water. So those are the real outcomes. That's the one we want to focus on, or like the Mississippi prisons I mentioned. DOJ investigation. Those are real outcomes. Some of the other things we hope for are that the newsroom might be revitalized by having emerging talent in it. If you bring digital natives into a newsroom, you can transform the newsroom. They're already thinking on different levels about how to share the story and really use what's available digitally. The, the other one, I, which I think you might be asking also, is like, what happens to the reporters at the end of their two years? So we have three reporters in Appalachia who were our first reporters. And I'll just, there are only three to graduate, and they graduated in January, right? Because we're in our third year. So we only have these three graduates. By June, we'll have 10 more. But I can tell you the three, I hope, reflect the future for the whole core, which is, one, Will Wright has just been hired by the New York Times, uh, the guy who broke the water story. He's now part of their fellowship program, which is a really interesting model. He's, he's, he's going to pursue that. Uh, Katie Coyne has stayed at the Gazette Mail, where she has dreamed of getting a job since she started getting into journalism as a freshman in college at West Virginia University. 
She loves that paper. She loves that motto, sustained outrage. She's a fierce local reporter who wants to stay there. The third one is Molly Bourne, who is so badass. Do you, I don't know if you saw, the New York Times did a story on us, and Molly was pictured standing on the streets uh, in, in a small town in West Virginia. And she's just there, and there's like the classic water tower, and it says, God bless America. And she's there, and she has the tattoo of West Virginia motto, motto the state motto tattooed to her back. She's awesome. She actually got a job with a documentary unit, the ones that did Heroin with an E, a very famous documentary team. So she's staying local, but pursuing a dream to come up and out of print and into documentary producing. So I think those three give you a sense. One stayed, one got a big job in a big city, and another one stayed, but shifted into a, a deeper narrative storytelling through documentary. We'll see as we go through the years, but our great hope is that people will stay. That's the first hope. Serve the community, deepen the knowledge. The second one is maybe propel some careers. Really try to bring a whole new generation of journalists along who can say, I started at a small newspaper and I worked my way up. A, a dream that we got to live out, that pipeline's broken. If we can restore the pipeline, I, I think it'll be, it'll be great. I'll answer later the entrepreneurial thing because I'm talking too much. Okay, and we have, a, all right, so we have a lot of questions. So we had a hand up uh, here, here, and then we'll go over here in, uh, in the back, Taya in the back, and this young lady here, here, and then there. So you know your order. <laughs> Got it, right? Okay, because I just forgot. That was good. But um, Patrick Butler with the International yeah, Center for Journalists. Just briefly introduce yourself. Yes, um, and my question actually follows on that one. You, you talked a little bit about it with the reporter who's staying at, yep. at her newspaper. Yep. And your funding model is really interesting, the 50%. I didn't realize that. But if yep. you could just talk a little bit, and actually for Liza too, yep. about how you make sure that the effect continues after the funding from your organization's ends? Well, first of all, we hope it won't end, right? Like, so when we have a reporter take the West Virginia newspaper, the Gazette Mail, just as an example, when Katie Coyne graduates out this June, or she graduated in January and stayed on, when we have a paper like the Dallas Morning News, where Obed Manuel is doing amazing reporting, he is himself a dreamer, and he's covering dreamers. It's an, he's an amazing reporter. Uh, really looking at second generation um, community in South Dallas where he grew up. We're not leaving the Dallas Morning News. Even though Ovid might graduate up and get hired, that's the dream, or maybe he'll go on to work with another paper in, in Dallas or shift, whatever, but we would like to think we gave him a start. I think he'll, he'll stay in Dallas, he'll stay in Texas. But the, the next thing is we then bring in a new person and we continue to serve the community. We want to find the news organizations we can grow with, so remember, the Gazette Mail was our first. We went from one reporter in the first class to four who will be putting, uh, you know, under that team of Greg Moore and of Ken Ward. Now, if they've left, the question is, where are they going? And do the four reporters, how do we work that out? We don't know. We're thinking what, what, what we care about is that we're serving the community. So we're going to see what constellation they form, how they develop, where they want to take their energy. We're going to figure it out. But one thing we know is the news organizations that work well with us are the ones we want to continue to support and fund and deepen. So it's not as if we go for two years and then we leave. Ideally, we stay. And we just did a big partnership with AP, a nonprofit, uh, to put uh, 16 statehouse reporters in places where they were undercovered in statehouses to serve all the local newspapers by having an extra statehouse reporter. So. We're not only working with the smaller sort of local public radio news uh, papers or digital, we're also thinking on a big scale, how can we have impact in the regions? Thank you. And then Shall we I? had, a, you know what, I think that, why don't we just get some of these questions in and incorporate answers Very as uh, the questions come in. And who is next? Okay. Yes. Hi, um, Peter Klein from the Global Reporting Center. Um, Charlie, you, you, you referenced how the first World Trade Center attack sort of brought the, the local into the global. We, most of us here kind of grew up in newsrooms where there was local, national, and the foreign desk, and yep. they're really siloed. Um, but of course, the, the world is not siloed that way, and increasingly less siloed. Um, you look at something like American Factory, the documentary that won the Oscar. Amazing. That Julia Reichert, the director, 
is a local from Dayton, Ohio. She was following the story of a, GM, a former GM factory and the transformation. Um, it was at least 50%, I would say more than 50%, a foreign story because it was about China coming in and this glass factory and the culture clashes and, right. and all of that. Um, how, I mean, this is really a question to all of you. How do you see um, the, the, the global aspects, particularly yeah. when it comes to supply chains and, and, and investments and, and jobs, um, factoring into the local stories? I'll answer by, by a, with a great shout out to Solutions Journalism and w because we just worked on a project that I think really gets at that question, which is we did a project on AIDS. We looked at, at AIDS in Southern Africa, in Namibia, and we looked at how they are really doing a good job in some of their programs uh, and, and, and not only addressing the crisis with AIDS, but also in sort of addressing some of the community needs for helping those who ha are HIV positive. And then we compared it to Atlanta, and we really looked at Atlanta where there was a deep crisis with AIDS, right in the shadows of the CDC. And I think Americans can learn a lot from this global local approach where, hey, Atlanta, CDC, you could learn a lot from Namibia about the, their programs and what they're doing on the ground. We have, since Ground Truth started eight years ago, we have always been global and local. We've looked at income inequality around the world through that prism of, of global and local. My dream is that we continue to work with Solutions Journalism Network on these global stories where we could take stories like, say, a post-coal distressed society. What does it look like in the rest of the world, in Poland or Brazil, China, where these other communities are going to have to extract themselves from the reliance on a coal economy? What strains and stresses and economic themes could we bring forward so we can think of these forces in a global way but stick to local reporting? That's the big dream down the road for Ground Truth, is that Report for America creates this inspired network of really talented local reporters who maybe we can help fund them to think globally in the next phase of their career. So it's going to take us a few years to get there, but that's the dream. But I would like to push back a little bit also on the fact that um, we are not siloed anymore. At the local level where we firmly believe the energy is at, uh, you have communities within the same city that have no idea what's happening 10 blocks away. And that is part of what we strive mm. to break, you know, to, to bridge with, with these collaboratives. You're all part of the same community, you're all, part, you're, you're all living in the same city, and you have no idea how your neighbors live, what they have or they don't have access to, and what should be addressed and what should not be addressed. You can go your whole life without meeting other members of your community. So I think... Um, Technology has given us sometimes the illusion of connectedness, I and mean, it does wonderful things, but also has sort of created this mirage that we are automatically connected, and then so we look at Namibia, but we don't look at 10 blocks down. Uh, this is, for example, specifically Miami, is a, is a very siloed city uh, where you have patchworks. It's a patchwork where you have patches that have no idea what the other patch is doing. Just a caution. So great mm. opportunity for local journalism. So I wanted to go back to, uh, to Taya Ryan from uh, Georgia Public uh, Broadcasting. And one thing, um, one thing I'd like to do before we close yep. is uh, for you to uh, tell Charlie and Liza how um, people in communities can get in touch with you right. and bring this funded resource that Knight Foundation funded to your community and the opportunities for local matching right. funds. So, hi. Hi. Um, okay. This is a fascinating conversation. I'm very... Um, we, we do a lot of partnering, and I believe that is uh, certainly our future for leveraging our resources at... Uh, public radio and public television in Georgia. But I'm really interested in this idea, and I know, Jennifer, you've been experimenting a bit with this, with public, private um, uh, organizations coming together, journalistic organizations coming together. And we have good relations with everyone. So is a good approach of what you're talking about a good place to start taking one idea, like you did with the mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 it, it, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, is a good place to start not to say, oh, hey, let's just in general partner, 
but pick one topic and bring in, say, five uh, commercial stations and five newspapers. And then I have the only worry I have is that the way we sound in public media is not the way they sound in um, commercial media. And so, and we each have to sound our own way. We, we've all learned that. And so that kind of partnership seems to me a delicate one, but one that only works if you recognize what each other's medium is and expectation is. But I'd really like to hear about, is that the right place to start? Pick a topic together, because I believe I can get a group of people around my state together to do that. So but I, I want to know what yeah. the trip ups are. I would say that one place to start, there have been multiple different uh, models around the country. And Liza, I think one of the things that I learned and deeply appreciated about the approach that the Solutions Journalism Network took in Philadelphia is they didn't just say, you know, hey, let's, you know, go to the uh, barn and put on a show and you do this and you do this and you do that. It was a lot of work. There had to be a lot of um, trust built um, among and respect. Uh, different organizations had to put aside, you know, their way of doing business and really learn, in some cases, to respect that different organizations did business differently. So if you could talk a little bit about that, I think that's so important. Yes. I, I don't want to disappoint you too much when I tell you that Philadelphia's collaborative started in a bar, which is where most journalistic <laughs> endeavors uh, start. Um, Not a barn, a bar. That's exactly yeah. right, B-A-R. Um, but yeah, I, I wrote a piece for Medium on this, and it's called You Have to Want to Be There. That is the essential, it sounds like a pedestrian <laughs> comment, but it is really true. It, all of these... Um, uh, factors that Jennifer just outlined are, are real. And so when you come together, you have to believe that uh, reporting together on an issue of importance to the community and making your community informed and engaged around this issue is the paramount goal. And for that, you have to make some adjustments to your thinking. Um, your uh, competitive spirit, um, your uh, idea that yes, perhaps you have more resources or you have a style that is not the same style as that ethnic publication. Uh, most of our collaboratives create a common website and that's where they put all of their um, uh, content that they have produced and then they have the right to take from that common website and reproduce that content in their own uh, respective outlets. But the interesting thing also, and we talk about editing, um, as the collaboratives get together, and again, we, we always say this collaborative is not a one night stand, it's not light like dating, it's a marriage. And so as you keep on talking and, you, and as you keep on finding things about coverage, uh, where are your gaps, what did you miss, uh, how could this be made better, uh, the issues that you're telling me organically start to resolve themselves and they are not a cause for conflict, they are a cause for discussion and to make each reporting or each outlet's reporting richer and then better as a group. I was very touched about a month ago when I went to the periodic meeting of the Charlotte uh, Collaborative when uh, the Spanish language um, uh, newspaper asked for money from the common pot that they have to spend so that they could do some translations from English into Spanish to publish in her paper. Everyone approved it. They thought it was great. But then the Charlotte Observer said, you know, we are exploring now the possibility to do some stories in Spanish. We have not done that before, and we want to explore that. And we see if we can better serve our constituency uh, by doing that. And for me, that was, oh, success, success. This is something that they would not have thought about before came out of this 
periodic collaboration. But it's, you know, a lot of quantity time until you find your quality time. And then your quality time gets more fr and more and more frequent. And, and that's we, how you do things. Yes, and we know that forced marriages don't work <laughs> or, or <laughs> that, all the time. That, that, that's anyway, exactly right. Anyway, so we have 10 minutes left, and I know that we have a lot of questions. So we're going to do, you know, 140 character, the old-fashioned character uh, uh, Twitter limit to get your question, and we promise that we'll do... Um, Short answers. I'll be quick. I'm Kristen Jones from the Colorado Trust, a foundation in Denver. Um, I'm curious if you can talk specifically about what you've done to um, recruit journalists of color and whether there is whether you pay spe special attention to retaining those journalists and making sure they're supported and stay in the field. Thanks. We, we have, um, we've hired um, a director of recruitment who's very active in NABJ and he's based in Chicago. We've really tried to make an effort for him to go out into historically black colleges, to go into all the different conferences for Asian, Hispanic, and black journalists and say, we are really um, open for business. We want to encourage you, if you're having a hard time as a journalist, uh, finding the pipeline to get started. Think about applying for a report for America, and then we can help assign you to newsrooms. Because the truth is, nationally, newsrooms want reporters of color. They want reporters who can reflect and understand and report on the communities where they live. So we think we become a national um, talent agency. We bring in really talented emerging reporters. Then we have news organizations that want those reporters. And we can actually make some change. And so we're, we're aggressively trying to do this. And we're using all tools, social media, every speaking engagement we can get. Any, any of you who want to offer a speaking engagement in your local communities, for example, our reporters are fantastic ambassadors of our, of our idea and our mission. We'd encourage you to think about doing that. Trying hard would be the short answer. Next question. OK. Uh, Steve Cox with the Wichita Community Foundation. And a question about the collaborative, just uh, real quick, does it, in Philadelphia, does a collaborative ever produce a, an article that is specifically referenced as a collaborative? Do they ever produce something online by, you know, from the collaborative, or do they always go back to their, to their own outlet? And, and when, they, when they publish, do they ever reference a collaborative, or do they always do it under their own byline? This is an excellent question. And yes, they use the tagline collaborative, uh, CJC, a Charlotte Journalism Collaborative, Resolve Philly. And they, uh, once a collaborative gets more comfortable, they do a lot more joint reporting. So you have two or three outlets that will get together to focus on this particular story for today and produce it in a multimedia format. So the TV station will bring the video, uh, print will do its thing, um, the uh, digital startup will uh, do some data crunching. So as a collaborative gets comfortable, there's more common reporting, but then all the individual reporting, they always reference uh, that they are part of the, um, of the collaborative in their, in their community. And just for a quick, uh, on Twitter, if you look at the hashtag broke in Philly, you'll see all of the work that has been produced in Philadelphia around covering um, the economy and the impact of uh, the economy on, on people. Another question. Michael Shapiro from Tap Into. I, uh, I, I heard that you had said that you have about like 2,000 reporters or potential reporters that have applied, but you're right. going to take a very small number. Um, have you thought about creating some kind of public database of those individuals that, you know, who don't make it? Yes, is the short answer. <laughs> yeah. We, we realized that um, first we had to ask them if it was OK if we did that. So we didn't in the time before, but now we have. We've said, we would like to share your great talents with other news organizations that might be looking to hire someone, but even if you don't get accepted into Report for America, is that okay with you? And we're getting resounding yeses. So now we can start to build it out as a real database and a real talent pool from which we can draw. Because I swear, you know, one of our funders asked us, how much do you want to scale this? 
and Steve Waldman, the co-founder, who really uh, was mentioned by Alberto today, who, who really, I think, is one of the most important voices in recognizing this crisis in local news. He talks about, we, we are going to get to 1,000 reporters. We are determined to get to this goal. It's in the grant agreement. It is. Yeah, I, I, know, I know. Thanks for reminding me. I have to be sitting down. So are, uh, <laughs> So is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Exactly. And, you are working and we're on trying it. our hardest. But we're, we're on track, right, with 250. We will get to 1,000 because we have to. <laughs> but even when, we get, the grant even when we get there, it will come nowhere near replenishing the 35,000 journalists who have lost their jobs in the last 15 years. Even if we could bring in a billion dollars to local reporting, it will nowhere near replenish the tens of billions that have been taken out of journalism in this crisis. So we have a huge, huge mountain to climb. And if we could become a hub for talent, for young people, to anyone who wants to grab them at any point, even if it's outside our selection cycle, we're working on that. And if you're interested in that, we could talk about it. Also, I have a colleague, Lauren, here, who's really one of our team leaders. She has one-pagers. And if anyone's interested in the model or how to reach us or anything, we'll, we'll have one pagers for you. And just so that you know, after lunch, we have a longer break than, than usual because lunch, uh, Kara Swisher uh, is going to be uh, producing a um, podcast with Jorge Ramos. So, um, so both um, Charlie and Lauren and Liza, we've set up tables um, outside yeah, the ballroom right. so that you can also come and, and speak and speak to them directly. So, you know, we're going to just take this one last um, question, and I'd really love um, Liza and uh, Charlie for you to uh, share with people in the room and our broadcast audience, um, live stream <laughs> audience, to uh, on how uh, people can find out how to bring these great projects okay. uh, to their communities and not just to their newsrooms, to their communities, and that includes funders. Great. Yes, sir. I'm Ken Henson from Columbus, Georgia, and I'm curious as to how you select the cities or the news organizations where you send these reporters. So for us, the selection process is really straightforward. We, we open it up. All newsrooms are free to apply of any size, stripe, whatever your medium. It could be radio, it could be television, it could be newspaper, it could be digital startup. As I said, we really love public radio stations. Just come forward with an application. Three things you got to share. One, that you have a news desert and you have a strategy to fill the gap. So however you define it, if you need better health coverage, if you need better coverage of the agricultural community, whatever it is, whatever is going on that you need better coverage of, prove that to us and that you have a plan. The second is that you are a, a news organization with a real track record for public service that you have a sustainable business model, you're going to be around for a while, and you've, you've got a mission that really serves your community. And the third one is mentoring and editing. And we're getting, to be candid, we're getting gamed on this one. The news organizations are saying, oh, we have a great editor we will assign to this reporter. And the truth is, the editors are so understaffed and stressed out that they, even if they wanted to be the greatest mentor ever, they can't be. So, we insist that you have a good editor, a mentor, someone to watch out for this emerging journalist. But we understand that is a stress point for small newsrooms. And we were, as I said, we want to find out good ideas. How could we, how could we solve that equation? Thank you. Liza. Jennifer. What? <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how can one of the things that I think it's important for folks here to learn is yes, you can um, seek to bring a solutions journalism collaborative to your community, but Solutions Journalism Network offers so many different resources and services. So tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. Um, the Local Media Project is one of the many initiatives that Solutions Journalism Network uh, is working on. Um, we have uh, initiatives to partner with newsrooms individually if you want to and any newsroom can approach us and say i would like to embrace solutions journalism net, uh, solutions journalism please come and teach me how to do it we work with individual 
uh, news professionals. Whether you're affiliated to, with an organization or not, we conduct seminars, we conduct webinars, we have a huge, um, uh, what we call our teaching lab um, in our website with resources such as um, case studies, um, uh, webinars, uh, research, uh, talking about solutions journalism. We can connect you with people who are doing solutions journalism. We can connect you with organizations that are doing solutions journalism. We aim to serve in the uh, altar of solutions journalism. Whichever way you want to approach solutions journalism, we reach all constituencies. We think that we can really transform uh, journalism um, not only in the United States, but in the galaxy. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good weapon that allows us to regain trust with our audiences. We, as journalists, we have talked a lot about losing trust and losing that special connection that journalism has with audiences. We have heard a lot about how relentlessly negative narratives um, simply make people walk away from journalism. Um, as a journalist, I've been to 100 activities, parties, where I, I am asked, what do I do for a living? And I say, I'm a journalist. And someone answers, oh, I don't watch news anymore. It's all negative, and it's all terrible. Well, that's a terrible answer. You should watch news. A part of being an informed and a productive citizen of your community is to be engaged with the news. It's to be part of the discourse. And we feel that solutions journalism is a very powerful weapon to do that. And so it changes the minds of journalists, but it also changes the minds of the news consumers. And there's also lots of um, foundations, such as the Lore Foundation, which has been a great partner of the Solutions Journalism Network and has has produced success in small <coughs> communities, rural communities, Absolutely. and city uh, neighborhoods. So, If I may give a shout yes. out to the Wichita Community Foundation that has yes. been incredibly <coughs> supportive and trying to get together uh, collaborative <coughs> in Wichita. Shelley Pritchard and Courtney Benson have been absolutely outstanding understanding how transformative this can be. So how do people get in touch? Liza at solutionsjournalism.org. <laughs> Solutions journalism, all one word. And of course, we wrote it out. Um, it's uh, in here as well. But please make sure, www.solutionsjournalism.org. You can go to our website, explore. We have the largest database of solution stories, so about 8,000 solution stories now, many wow. produced by uh, reporters from Report for America on any subject. You want to look at gun violence, key in gun violence, see what has been written. You want to do achievement gap in public school systems, you can key in that and uh, by author, by state, by city. So it's a, a very a versatile and very searchable database among our other resources. Excellent, and also a great way for uh, foundations to listen and to learn about the Absolutely. concerns of peoples in their communities. Charlie, yes. how do they get in touch with you? Uh, so reportforamerica.org is our website, and I'm at csenate at reportforamerica.org. Um, and really, please get in touch and be ambitious. I was thinking about um, the, the question from Georgia, public media, and the question, the other question from Georgia. Be ambitious in a region where there's need. Think about working together. I am from print, but I began in public radio. and. And our headquarters at Ground Truth were now based at WGVH. We're independent, but they give us a really great newsroom. And I would say there's tremendous partnership between newspapers and public media, especially. And there's so much to be done there. I, I'm trying, like, you know, I feel like the child of divorced parents, newspapers and public radio. If you could get those two together, the power to serve the community is extraordinary. They haven't always like been easy to stitch together, right? But it, it really could be powerful. So I'd say be ambitious. Think about applying for a cluster of Report for America organizations. Think about solutions in partnership with that. Like how can you build something from scratch, create a lab? I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe it's health. Maybe we did this AIDS project. Maybe there's a real need for better local reporting on a crisis in AIDS in the shadow of CDC. or. Maybe there's completely different issues around rural health or whatever, but think about how you'd be really ambitious and reach out to us and, and we're all ears. Well, we do have a uh, Macon 
Georgia. Right. We have a wonderful partnership with Public Radio in Macon yep. and with Mercer University. And Macon Telegraph. And we had a report the, from America. Yes, Corman. and with um, Macon Telegraph, which yeah. is owned by McClatchy, which right. just went bankrupt, and that has caused a lot of um, a lot of concerns right. about the future uh, of that collaborative, but we're confident yep. with uh, um, commitment to delivering and producing Can, journalism there. I forgot there. to mention this, Jennifer. I'm sorry. Just at our desk today, I want to, this is a report Steve Waldman and our really great colleague who's here, um, Todd Franco, who's our director of sustainability, who's the direct contact for regional foundations to try to raise the local piece of the funding. They've put together the impact we've had just in the last year of raising a million dollars from local foundations. These are in like increments of about ten to twenty thousand dollars from local foundations to pull forward as part of our national match. So there's real information here that might help you. I have a couple of copies of it. We'll have more at the table, but if you're interested, we, we can share that with you. Data is good. Data is good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and look forward to more conversation.